And do you guys think that the Knicks not getting involved is yet another sign that they're just loading up yeah. to maybe take a run at either Joel Embiid or uh, perhaps Carl Anthony Towns? Because they they have they yeah. still have the assets to make a, I mean, they could make a deal for Damian Lillard. I think the Knicks feel like they have their point guard, and I think they're probably thinking, "Let's we're going to try to go after the, a big man or a you know some six ten forward or something like that that can play." Well, let me switch over to my Knicks fan TV hat for a second. Uh, yeah, yes, to Joel Embiid. Great segue. Great segue. No, no to Carl no. Anthony Towns. No, thank you. Carl Anthony Towns. No, you don't want you don't want Joel Embiid. No, oh, I do. Absolutely. No, I yeah. do want Joel Embiid. Give yeah. me Joel Embiid. Yeah. No to Carl Anthony Towns though. Yeah. I don't think he. I don't think him and, and Brunson would be a good pairing. Yeah, I, yeah, I think they're stacking it up. Yeah. They're they're waiting for what happens in Philadelphia. Uh, I think Mitchell is more of a of a candidate. Spider Mitchell again, rather than Carl Anthony Towns. Yeah, I, I think it's Mitchell and Embiid. They're they're sitting idly by. I think that's why they stacked up the guard rotation, adding DiVincenzo, who will help the team, but it's still going to muddy up the rotation. I think they're just waiting, waiting to yeah. make to make that push. And, and I also think that Jalen Brunson is a guy that's going to attract players. I think what the Knicks have done is they've, I think that right now they're viewed as a more stable franchise. What's gone on the last three years, they're making the playoffs, getting out of the first round this year. And Jalen Brunson is all about the team. I mean, you look at every level that he's been at, you know, whether it's high school, I mean, no, nobody wins two college championships anymore. And now in the NBA, you know, he had, he had as the lead guard on a team, they finished with the fifth best record in the East. They beat Miami. Three times during the regular season, they took him to a game six. The guy just is a winning player. I still don't understand how these GMs all pass on him Passed. when he was available. I mean, listen, I've known him for a long time in the family, so maybe I, I'm probably slightly biased. But I saw the the guy play. My daughter went to school with him. I saw him play all the time. Has like you don't think he's going to be a good NBA player? I find that one a little hard to believe. We're allowed to not know that. We don't get yeah. paid to be scouts. They make really good money. They should know that. Yeah, true indeed, man. And uh, look, Knicks had a great year. I th thought they had a great run two games away from the conference finals. I, I think anybody would have signed up for that based on where they were projected to finish. Uh, but what, what do you think about Julius, Frank? You know, Julius, we talk about Julius <laughs> Randle at length uh, on uh, on our show, Knicks Fan TV, and throughout the year. I can't think of a more polarizing yeah. player in Nick history that is just literally peaks and valleys, high, high peaks, very low valleys than, than a Julius Randle. What, what's your take on his situation? I'll Where say this, you know, in his defense, after the way that he played last year and just like that interaction with the fans, which wasn't good, and you wonder, like, sometimes you start that and it never, you could really never get it back. I mean, he had a terrific, a terrific season this year. He still was an all-star, but to your point, just too inconsistent. Then that that's, a, that's always going to be – a big problem. If they were going to trade him, he does have some value now, but I, I doubt that's going to happen. But I, I'll say this. Remember where he was and where he's been now on the Knicks. I mean, it barely was a starting player. It was only a couple of years. Nobody When the Knicks got him, everybody thought, oh, this will be just like kind of a one-year rental. And he has played pretty well over the last two seasons. I'd like to see the ball a little bit more in Jalen Brunson's hands. And I think that's what Brian Scalabrini, when I do the radio show with him, he says that Randall plays a lot better when he's moving the ball. Yeah, absolutely. Once yeah. he starts pounding it into oblivion, oh, that's goodness. when everything slows down and it, it kind of kills the flow of the offense. There's no question about it. And that's just kind of been the conundrum. And to see if I think it's more, it's not peaks and valleys. There's a legitimate divide between <laughs> like Nick's fandom. Like, are you pro Julius or are you anti Julius? Right. I mean, when I was out in Vegas, I was like, Every time I talked about the Knicks, and I saw a couple like a couple Knicks fans. They're like, "Yeah, I think we can go to the next level." But and I'm like, "Who are you thinking of, Julius?" They're like, "Yeah, man." And it's like, or you're like, "Yeah, Julius is the greatest player that we've had since that." It's like it's so it's so divided right now between Julius. But to your point, Frank, like it's clear as night and day. Like when he moves the rock and he can move without the ball, like everything happens. And I think that's the more confusing part of his game is that he can do it, and then he goes he reverts back to some games where it's like. He's just like playing with his food too much, you know, or it's like he wants to show that he's really this excellent ball player where like he can do whatever he want, maybe like to a LeBron James level. But it's like, yeah. if you just play with your game, like if you play within your envelope to what we've seen, like moving the rock, getting to position, finding your open teammate, that's actually when you're 10 times better than you holding onto the rock for 10 seconds and then putting up some rando shot. And, and you wonder too sometimes about the dynamic of a locker room. And I'm, I mean, I'm just throwing this out there. So he, he was the guy. Then here comes Jalen Brunson, 
And he is, you know, he becomes quickly the face of the team. His dad's on the coaching staff. His, um, you know, his agent's father is the GM. He know, you know, he's had this relationship. You wonder if Julius Randle feels like, oh, I wonder I'm not that guy anymore. But what I think he'd be missing the point is that Jalen Brunson isn't about that. It's not like Jalen Brunson said, this is my team. We will do everything my way. He's all about the team. It's not It's not about himself. And look at the guys that he played with in Villanova. Look how well all of them do in the pros. He was always part of an ensemble cast. And remember, last year when they, you know, in the playoffs, you know, Luka missed a couple of those first games against the Utah Jazz, and Jalen raised his level of play. He's all about the team. So Julius Randle, I think, is in a terrific situation. I just hope it's not that petty jealousy which sometimes invades teams and invades ego. locker rooms ego yep. ego and uh yeah it's gonna be interesting to see how they carried forward in year two together well, what do you think about the Di Vincenzo pickup frank oh i like it it's i think you have to be a wildcat either a kentucky wildcat a villanova <laughs> wildcat <laughs> or a caa wildcat <laughs> right, you have to be right. one of those to be on the <laughs> team now hey when he First of all, he was better for Golden State than Jordan Poole. Jordan Poole's taking yeah. crazy shots. Steven yeah. Chenzo will rebound. He could score. I think the big thing for him will be staying healthy. You know, the year yeah. that they won in Milwaukee, he didn't play because he was hurt. Mm. This year, kind of in and out in the lineup. But that dude competes. I, I think, you know, him being with guys that he knows, playing for Tom Thibodeau, I think that was a good move for them. I think a lot of – and I, I'm, I'm glad that they got him. I think a lot of fans were thinking – What's going to be the home run move we're going to make? Because everyone yeah. last year was waiting for Donovan Mitchell. Everyone thought that was going to happen. I think everyone's waiting to see that move because, you know, the, the Knicks have a terrific team, but you want to see them kind of take that next step to really move close to be a, a being a contender. Now, the guard position for the Knicks is a little cluttered. I mean, you got Grimes, Quickly, DiVincenzo, Brunson. Um, what do you think this is like the do you think this is like the the calling card for that quickly will be move with the DiVincenzo signing? Yeah, I, I could see something like that because you know Brunson's going to play a lot of minutes. He wants mm -hmm. to play. I think he was hurt during the playoffs and he still played mm -hmm. a ton of minutes. He's just a, he's just cut that way, and Tom is going to rely on him a lot. He has a lot of faith in him. But those other guys are going to play. That's why I found it funny with the story about Evan Fournier who came out and was kind of complaining about not playing. And I know some of the Nick fans all of a sudden were about Derrick Rose and Evan Fournier. So on the one hand, you wanted all the young guys to play. Now that the young guys are playing, everybody was wondering – what happened to Evan Fournier? And remember when he, Evan Fournier was playing, I think they were 10 and 13 and he was shooting yeah. like 30% on Wasn't three. It? So they finally made the switch to the young guys. There were, those guys will all get a chance, but you know what it's going to come down to how they're competing on the defensive end. You can't be a one way player. What time is not going to work. I absolutely cannot, man. Uh, also on the Knicks, um, you know, last week or so, and shout out to our guy, Fred Katz, who covers the Knicks for, for The Athletic. He used to cover the Knicks on the beat, Frank, many moons ago before, uh, before he moved on to bigger and better things. But the lack of media access continues to, uh, you know, be an issue to those in the beat. Uh, Fred Katz at The Ath Athletic reported that the Knicks had declined a request from, from The Athletic uh, for President Leon Rose to hold an on-the-record media availability. Lo Rose has not spoken on the record to independent media in almost two years, has not done a solo press conference since uh, joining the Knicks in 2020. Knicks also uh, are not making DiVincenzo available, no news conference, just a, uh, a faxed in memo about how great he is. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I think I this, my, my thought is it probably comes from ownership, and I think what the Knicks do is NBA mandated media they will abide by those rules. So day of practice, coaches available, some of the players, not every player is, is required to pra, uh, to talk. Day of game, coach will talk at shoot around. He'll talk before game. He'll talk after game. The locker room will be open. The players are available to talk. The yeah. Knicks are not going to grant any other access for press conference, which of course to me is short sighted. When you when you sign Jalen Brunson, why wouldn't you have a press conference for him? Right. Celebrate the whole thing. Now I get it. Some people thought, oh, people are going to ask him whether or not they were tampering. I'd want that question asked. I would want Jalen Brunson, who's pretty smart, to say, "Did my father ask me where I was going to play basketball? Yeah, he's my father. <laughs> Did he said I should consider the Knicks? Yes, he said that because he's my father. And ultimately, I made the choice. That was me because I'm an adult." Yeah. End of tampering and all this other nonsense. But after the season, you you want a playoff series, put Tom Thibodeau and have Jalen uh Jalen Brunson up there and then have Leon Rose talking. I don't I don't understand that part of it. 
and I know a lot of the people that you know that watch you guys and and listen to you will say, ah, oh, I don't care about the media. I'm glad that they're not answering questions. Well, remember that the next time you go to a restaurant and you're unhappy with the service, and they say, I want to talk to the manager. They say, no, 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 you're not allowed to. How is it any different? Well, you know what? I, because I, I don't like Frank- the plumbing job you did. No, 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 no. I'm not talking. We're not talking. The thing it's- is, is that you, you watch, and you know they got Leon Rose on on the MSG show. Clearly with cookie cutter canned answers, right? The, the PR stooges, they're, they're drafting up all his responses. They have um, uh, Dolan. He'll go on K-Show. He'll go on Joe and Evan or, or Carton and Roberts with a full notebook of answers. That yeah. he's like, hold on one second. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> he's like, wait, eight, know. three, continue. You know, it's just not, there's no authenticity in those interviews. And, and you know, so years ago, and it was the year that Larry Brown was covering the team. I should probably write a book about that. Yeah, that was we, that we was a crazy it. year. Yeah. But we're in Memphis, and you know the the whole thing is falling apart. Unlike the week before, it was falling apart. It was just nuts. We walk into the gym, and Jim Dolan was in there with Hank Ratner, a couple other Nick officials, and Isaiah was in there, and it looked like Jim Dolan had talked to the team. And we go to Larry Brown. We ask him if. Jim had spoken to the team, and Larry, and Larry was the best. He's like, yeah, I don't like that. I don't like when people are talking to my team. The way Larry talks. Yeah. He's, he's now upset that the owner and Isaiah were addressing the team after practice. So thank you, Larry, for giving us the easy story. The next day, we're going to get Jim Dolan uh, in the hotel at uh, after the after the uh, team had eaten breakfast. So they brought us into this room, and I kid you not. And like, you know, the way the media is, if you're going to give people free food, like we attack it like uh, like hyenas. <laughs> so they said, go, there's food over there. You go over there. There was like a half a piece of French toast. Was, <laughs> but there was, not like, come on, man. Like, do that to like the rats. Yeah, yeah. A, there was no food, which, all right. I sit down, have a cup of coffee. And Jim Dolan would sit there and he was good. He would talk. You know, mm. listen, sometimes he said something you could see the PR guy go, oh, like, you know, make make a face knowing that we could turn that into a headline. But we yeah. used to get along with him pretty well. I think what happens was when you become the owner and the team is losing and when you start to become part of the criticism, I think he had a really tough time handling that. Jerry mm. Jones doesn't care. Yeah. yeah. Mark yeah. Cuban likes it because yeah. he likes to engage. There were just some owners that are going to be like that. Jim Dolan didn't like that. He likes sitting courtside and being near the bench, and he's going to bring guests to them. I'm the owner of the team. Look at the players. They look at me. They give me – they nod. I'm friendly with them. Oh, I'm on the back page of the paper, and they're and they're killing me and the team because we just won 23 games. He didn't like that part of it, and he would lash out a little bit at the media. And I always would say, you know, we don't dictate the coverage. The results dictate the coverage. Believe me. Go back to 90s. I know it's a long time ago. Yeah. You have to go to the archives. Go back to 97 when they won 57 games. Yeah, go back to yeah. 99 when they made the finals. I'm pretty sure the coverage was what you would consider pretty favorable, but I think that's the issue. He doesn't – they're not going to have the players talk, and I think I think ultimately it hurts the players in terms of even their brand a little bit because Jalen Brunson is great. Yeah. And the year that he had – that he should be out front and center. They should have flown him out to Vegas and said, oh, by the way, Jalen will be available uh, tomorrow, guys, at 3 o'clock, come by the gym. Yeah, That's what I would do. Have mm-hmm. that guy become – I would have two spokesmen Absolutely. on the team, the coach and the star player. Guess who does that? All these teams. Look at Darvin Ham, yeah. LeBron yeah. James, all the teams. Jimmy Butler, Eric Spolstra, Nikola Jokic, and Michael Malone. That's the way it's always been done. It was the way it was done when Pat Riley was here. Pat mm-hmm. Riley had the media eating out of his hand when he coached the New York Knicks. Now he's taking it to a different level in Miami. He's, he's basically got – he runs that town. Yeah. But I think it's a way to help your franchise. And Tom learned under Jeff Van Gundy. He knows how to handle that stuff. And you have Jalen Brunson. That's That should be the message every day coming from the Knicks. It should be mostly from those two guys. And that's like how you help a player get into superstardom, right, is because of that's that right. ability. So as to your point, Jalen should be out there. I mean <laughs> – he had 41 points in a game six yeah. by himself when no one else could could hit the broad side of a barn. So I would totally, as to your point, Frank, have him out there. But, you know, there's another part of Knicks, the Knicks fan base that says, you know, what what are we going to get from Leon Rose anyway? He's not going to give us any intel on what his next move is or anything like that. So why even have, you know, the journalists ask him any questions? What would your response be to that? Well, I, well first of all, it's the job of the reporters are try to get information on what, you know, 
what the team is trying to do. Last year, you guys made a run for Donovan Mitchell. Do you feel you need to add a star to this team? He's going to have to give you, he's got to give you some kind of answer. It, it's not, first of all, it's not going to be very negative because the Knicks had a terrific season. But I would think the fan base wants to know yeah. what is the plan here? And it gives him a chance to kind of outline what the plan is. I always say this. One of the best moments every year is after the Miami Heat get eliminated. It's about you know two or three days after the fact. And Pat Riley sits there and he gives you the state of the Miami Heat. And he tells you everything, you know, to a certain degree, what he can say, what he can reveal to you. And he kind of sets the agenda for what the offseason is going to be like. I think it's the opportunity to kind of shape what your message is. Joe Cronin used that in Las Vegas to tell people exactly where the Portland Trailblazers stood with Damian Lillard. I think he helped himself there. I just think the Knicks, they do themselves a disservice, especially, listen, Leon, I covered Leon, and I've known Leon forever as an agent. Leon did not like being quoted as an agent. That wasn't his thing. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to be quoted in the paper. He didn't like any of that stuff. Tom and Jalen Rose, though, they could do that job. And I just said, once having the GM talk before the season and after the season is not a big deal. That's not asking for too much. Yeah, yeah, the Knicks don't even have a GM right now. We just got a president of basketball operations. Yeah, right, yeah president. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's Gerson, man. Gerson's definitely getting the gig, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, once again, we are talking to Frank Isola, man. Covers the NBA, CP the franchise. Uh, Alex Rotaro's on the ones and twos here. Suits everybody in the chat. We've got a lot of people in the chat here commenting here. So uh, let's get those likes up. Hit that share button and subscribe to the channel. Now, uh, we've been talking NBA, but obviously with Frank having covered the Knicks, we got to dig into a little bit of Knicks talk here. And Frank, man, I was going through... I got this Knicks fans ultimate fact book from the year 2000, man. And uh, I turned over to the beat section and I got a couple of interesting uh, photos here. Number one, see if you can make that out. I, I, this, it's, I see Berman on there. I might be a little blur, blur, blurry. And then we got a young Frank Isola, man. A young Frank. Uh, where is he? There, there he is. It's a little blurry yeah. on the camera, but there he is, man. Young Frank Isola, New York. I see Dave D'Alessandro, Greg Logan on there. Yeah. yeah. The whole crew. Yeah, man. Mike Doherty, who was, Journal News. Who was covering for the New York Times? Is that New Selena or? Yes, yeah, Selena um, Roberts. Selena Roberts. Roberts. Broke, broke the A-Rod story, right? When A-Rod was on Roy's, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part I, of yeah, I did. Yeah, Selena Selena's very good. She's She was a, a bit of a pit bull yeah. on the beach. She she yeah. would uh, she would go after people, that's for sure. Who was uh, <laughs> who, who's your favorite player to cover when you were there? You know, I got the guy that I really hit it off with and it was good because he really ran the locker room was Larry Johnson. Mm. So Larry didn't really want to deal with the media when he first got there. I think he probably heard horror stories and he realized we're just a bunch of, you know, a bunch of softies, but I really became very close to him. And, and then you would hear Jeff Van Gundy, Tom Thibodeau talk about him. You know, Larry used to get to games. I think at four o'clock because he didn't want to take, he had the back issue and he didn't want to take, um, the anti-inflammatory, so we'd have to do a lot of stretching to get himself ready to play. The amount of work that this guy put in, and he was the one guy that everybody, whether it was the young players, the older players, everyone respected Larry Johnson. Plus, remember, when he came to the Knicks, he had changed his game. He When he was in Charlotte, he was grandmama playing above the rim. The back injury made him a different kind of player, but he relied yeah. on his quickness and all these like little, you know, playing angles and the way that he was in the post with spin moves. Yeah. But I, I loved I loved covering him. I love covering uh Charles Oakley. Ch you know, Charles is my guy. Charles was great. Charles would get mad at you. It was weird because you know the 97 season, the Knicks are gonna have a good team. And in, like the second game of the year, Charles didn't play in the fourth quarter. Whatever the Knicks had going that night. Mm -hmm. Jeff just stuck with that lineup. And then after the game, of Charles like, whatever, whatever. I don't know why I'm not in there. And it's like <laughs> kind of ticked off. So we all write it. The players then all give Charles a hard time. And Jeff gave him a hard time about it. And then Charles took it out on us. I can't believe you guys wrote that bull. <laughs> Charles, you're the one that said it. But the players were always like that back then. So yeah. Jeff, Jeff Van Gundy takes over for the Knicks. And they, they start out. They lose in Philly. They beat the great Michael Jordan team. They go on a... Texas trip and the last uh, game was in San Antonio. And if you remember, Anthony Mason was the, you know, God rest his soul. Yeah. Anthony Mason was the point forward under Don Nelson. They would, Don Nelson was trying to get away from Patrick Ewing, mm -hmm. really get away from Try to trade him. He wanted Jack. either Patrick gone or Don Nelson eventually left. So yeah. he got away from, but Jeff was like, it was going to be Patrick. We're going to get the ball into Patrick play through him. So after the game in San Antonio, 
Anthony Mason is buck naked, is staring into the locker room, and Derek Harper, who was a great guy to cover too, was like whispering in his ear. So a couple of us notice it, and we're looking, and we're like, we got to ask him what's going on. So we go over to Anthony Mason, and all we said was, is everything all right? He starts going off. I don't like what's happening. I think they're phasing me out. Why are we all of a sudden going back to Patrick? And we're all standing there with our microphone, writing, writing, writing. And we end up writing the story, and the next day he says that he was misquoted. <laughs> and we have we, we have it on tape, and it was me and Mike Wise from the Times who was cover who were covering. He said, "I'm never talking to Frank and Mike ever again." And this was so this was in March. The Knicks play Chicago in the second round of the series. We're at Moody Bible College in Chicago after a Nick practice. The bus was in the back. He thought the bus was in the front. He walks out, and all of a sudden I walk out too, and the two of us are facing each other. And he says, "What's up?" I said, "How are you doing?" God, can you believe this? Like, uh, they're giving the ball to Patrick, and I think they're trying to phase me out. He started repeating exactly <laughs> what he told me. And, more, and he said, you know, when he said he's not going to talk to him anymore, he hadn't spoken to me until that day in Chicago. And back then, I'm like, I am not writing any of this. You can still get me. But go ahead. I'm not, I'm not writing any. But those guys were great. It was also different. There's no social media. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no Twitter. And, then you know, the newspapers had a much bigger impact. But, great, you know, like Derek Harper was. Harper's great. One of a kind. Let me tell you a quick story about him. Yeah. So Jeff gets the job on a Friday in Philadelphia. We go to Jeff's room. Again, you'd be arrested if you did this today. Mm -hmm. Three of or four of us knock on his door. He answers. We interview Jeff. They're going to play Philly that night. That Philly team stinks. Mm -hmm. Jeff lost that first night. People mm -hmm. always forget that. Mm -hmm. Jeff's first game, he loses. The next day, they go up to purchase. They have about a three-hour practice, and we're just sitting outside the gym. We couldn't believe they were practicing this long because they're playing the Chicago Bulls at 5 o'clock at Madison Square Garden. It's going to be Selection Sunday, and NBC would always put the Knicks and the Bulls at about that 5 o'clock yeah, area. They wanted here. them to watch the game. The players are all like, I can't believe the practice we had. It feels like the old Knicks, all this stuff. Jeff then has a shoot-around the next day at the Garden. <laughs> so they have a shoot-around on a day where they're going to have a 5 o'clock game. I go to the shoot around. I see Derek Harper after the shoot around. He's just sitting down. He's completely drenched and exhausted. And we're just talking. And he says, man, he goes, if you bet, he goes, you should bet on us because I'm telling you, we're going to win this game tonight. And the, that was the 72, 72 win Bulls. Yeah. yeah. And I remember yeah. thinking, you guys just lost to Philly last. I didn't say this to him. I'm like, you guys just lost to Philadelphia, <laughs> that crappy team. You guys are going to get smoked. And sure enough, the Knicks played great. And Derek Harper, late in the fourth quarter, was he had an unbelievable game. And after a timeout, they, you know, go New York, go New York, go. The, the crowd is going crazy. And he was standing near us at the scorer's table, and he just looked at me, and he, and he winked. He said, I told you, Frank. It was a pretty – it was a, it was a, back then when we sat uh, court time. One more – just a yeah, addendum yeah. to that story. The Knicks play Chicago. Everyone is asking Phil Jackson after the game about the Knicks job. And Jeff – had you know come up through Pat Riley and they had wars back then. You know, Pat Riley and Phil Jackson used to kill each other in the press. Yeah. So Phil Jackson starts campaigning for the job. The Knicks, the next day, fly to Dallas. They're gonna have an off day. Or they're gonna practice. We go to the practice, the practice ends. We're talking to Jeff, and Jeff said, Hey, let me ask you guys a question. Now we didn't really know that much about Jeff. And he said, What did you guys make of Phil Jackson openly campaigning for a job that's being that's currently held? And we said, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure the Knicks want him. And he starts destroying Phil Jackson. And we're like writing. <laughs> and it was like, oh, this is going to be good. This is we like in three days, all the stories were better than any story we had. The, you know, Jeff getting the job, then beating the Bulls, and then Jeff going after Phil. Like Jeff went after Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. The whole absolutely. league was afraid yeah. of Michael Jordan. Yeah. Like that's like in the MLS right now. Be the first player that commits a dirty foul on Lionel Messi and mm -hmm. be the coach that goes after Lionel Messi. Good luck. Jeff was going after, like, you know, Michael Drew. You needed the Pope to bless you before you did something like that. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff was a trip, man. Jeff he was fun to cover. Care, man. That was why that's this is my favorite Knicks coach. He was a, he was a bulldog, man, an absolute bulldog. I, I remember, uh, I think Harp told us a story when when Jeff got like hip checked by Oakley. At uh, at one of their South Carolina practices, and almost went after Oakley. I don't know if it was Harper, might have been Chris Herring that told that story when he was talking about uh, blood in the garden. Uh, but uh, yeah. Jeff is tough as nails, man. I'll tell you what, Jeff. One time, Xavier McDaniel showed up in Charlotte. He wasn't on the Knicks anymore, and he walked at the play. I mean, Xavier McDaniel. He played one year, right? Yeah, one year. One year, just one. The mm -hmm. players love that guy. Like he's and Xavier's a nut. 
He walked into the locker room. He said something to Jeff, which he must have been busting Jeff about something. And Jeff punched him in the chest. I could not believe how hard Jeff punched him. And, and X Men didn't even. It didn't even move. And all the players are just looking at him. You know, then they start, you know, f bombing each other back. It was all, it it was all in uh, good fun. But yeah. Jeff was a piece of work. I will say this about the Knicks, though. They in '97 they had a great team. They won the '57 games. They beat the Bulls three times. And if you guys remember, the last game of the season, they played the Bulls, and everybody played. This is how different the NBA was. Yeah. The game didn't mean anything to anybody. But Michael played, Pippen played, you know, Patrick played, Allen Houston, everybody. The Knicks win that game, and Pippen shot an air ball, which would have won the game. He missed a three, shot an air ball. So the Knicks end up taking three from Chicago. Then, of course, the fight happens with Miami. Yeah. The Knicks were convinced, convinced that they were going to win the That's championship it. that year. Yeah. But, like, I always felt like watching Michael Jordan play in person, which for me is the greatest thrill of all the years that I covered sports, like, it was amazing watching him play. I just never thought. Back then, anyone was going to beat him four out of seven times. I just yeah. didn't. I just didn't think it was. If he was healthy, he was just going to find a way to win. I want to believe because I loved those guys on the Knicks back then. Like it would have been cool if they could have beaten him, but I don't know. As as Larry Johnson would always say, that black cat. That's yeah, what the said. black cat. Right, that's what they called Michael. Black that cat. black cat. Yep. Uh, absolutely, man. And and out, man. You know, Frank thought he was going to get tomatoes in the chat, man. The people nope. are loving the Knicks stories. This is the NBA report, but Knicks fan TV is taking over. Uh, shout out to Ms. Carroll's math class in the chat. She said, Frank, you're okay with me despite what the Knicks fans say. Would love to see you on KFTV. We got Hulu Caesar says, more stories. Always great to hear from Isola. So we're kind of doing like a little PR for you here, man. Now, I, I, I don't I don't get the whole criticism. I'm just covering the team. When the team does badly, what do you want me to say? Listen, I think I think. Let me ask you a question. Was I wrong? I criticized. I didn't think the hire of Phil Jackson was going to yeah. be a great hire. Like yeah. I don't think it's a like learn on the fly type of position. Yeah. And I just think I also felt that Phil sadly wasn't in great health. Like you need to like grind when you, you do gotta, that job. You got to grind. That's, yeah. not, that's not an easy job. Yeah. Listen, if you were hiring Phil Jackson to be the coach. I get it. Yeah. You know, the guy is a legendary coach. They're hiring to be a first time GM. It's not, it's not an easy job, man. Like, you think Sam Presti isn't grinding every day? Yeah, it's true. I, I think even mm -hmm. Magic had said it when he had stepped down from the, from, you know, Lakers always had Magic in and out of those executive positions. But yep. I think the last time he was there, he said, listen, this, you need a full time commitment here. And this is when they were saying Phil was sleeping in, in draft workouts and, you know, drafting all these guys. But um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us just, just, wanted it to work out because of the name and the person I get it. the Vincent oh, yeah. there. You know, he's smart. He's, you know, everything. But it was a disaster, man. Complete disaster. Yeah. I also think too with Phil and I listen, the guy again, legendary coach. But if you're around Jeff Van Gundy, he always invokes the name of Patrick Ewing. You're around Pat Riley, he mentions Magic, Kareem, he mentions Patrick Ewing. You surround Greg Popovich, he's mentioning Tim Duncan, David Robinson, Mano and Tony Parker. You're around Phil? I'll give you a nickel for every time he mentions Michael Jordan. He doesn't really mention his name that much. A little bit of it is a little too much, the coaching part of it. You did yeah. coach Michael Jordan. Be proud of that. You won with the guy. That's that. There's something to be said for yeah. coaching great players and winning with them. That, that that was the other. And then at his press conference, you know, and you knew what the press conference was going to be, and they rolled out the red carpet as they should. And even uh, Don Henley, not Don Henley, um, one of the Eagles was there, uh, Glenn Fry was there because he was friendly with Irving Azoff who kind of helped put the deal together yeah. with Jim Dolan. And I'll never forget Phil Jackson. You knew it was going to happen. He's going on and on about the beloved Nick championship teams and the connection and this and the connection. I kept thinking, yeah, that's all well and good, but you still weren't going to take the job if you, unless you were making between like 12 and $15 million. It wasn't, it wasn't red, the connection with Brett Holtzman yeah. and Willis Reed that brought you to New York. Yeah, was Let's right. be fair now. You know, they, they were going to have to pay you big time bucks to do it. Now, I got to ask before we go on to the next topic, because you saw if you're around Vegan Gundy, then you saw Tom Thibodeau. <laughs> so what do you have any stories about Tom Thibodeau uh, dur during any of those practices or his uh, assistant coaching tenure? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this about Tom. One of the coolest things that I remember, or this is early on. I always used to just talk to Tom because he'd be, you know, he was always working out guys very early. You know, they talk about player development. He was always working the players out. And he was done working out a few guys. He was just sitting near the court at the garden. And I, I had brought my son to the game because the Knicks were about to play the Lakers. Out comes 
Kobe Bryant, and he and Tom have a big hug. They're talking. Tom introduces me to him. And then I introduce him to uh, Kobe to my son. He could not have been any nicer. And then Kobe started telling the story about how when he was in high school in Philadelphia, he would go to St. Joe's where the Sixers had practiced, mm. and he would scrimmage with them whenever he was available. And when the scrimmages were over, Tom would sit there working with Kobe Bryant, working mm. him out, and was teaching him stuff. Now, it, and that's at the time when nobody knows that Kobe Bryant's going to become Kobe Bryant. You know that he's a terrific player. You don't know that he's going to become this legendary guy. But that's how Tom had the connection with Kobe. And that's why it was so cool years later when Tom was an assistant coach with Boston and they play the Lakers in the finals. And Kobe was asked about, you know, how do you think Boston will stop you? And he said, well, Tom Thibodeau will, will try to figure out a way. Like, so it was, but Tom, listen, Tom's a great guy. He's just very loyal. You know, his guys are Jerry Tarkanian, uh, John Lucas, who he's very close with, Ron Adams, who's an assistant coach with the Warriors. You know, those guys were as thick as thieves. Mm. He was with those guys for a long time. And Bill uh, Bill Musselman, obviously, who he had in Minnesota. But, you know, to me, it's like he's more from the Jeff coaching tree because that's where he really got his big break. <laughs> 